So, um, that's just to give you a little bit of background and um, Monique has arranged for us to have a wonderful person with us today uh, to introduce you to storytelling. And um, this is uh, Yanni Lozon. I don't know how many of you uh, uh, had an opportunity to see the wonderful production of King Lear that just finished at the National Arts Centre. Uh, it was an all Aboriginal production and uh, Yanni uh, played two major roles in that. She was Cordelia and she was also the Jester. Now I first um, encountered Yanni, this was back in the mid 90s, and she put on this terrific performance. I don't know how many flutes she was playing at that time because she's trained as a classical flutist, but she had this whole array of native flutes as well. And she's also a wonderful blues singer. And of course, she is a terrific actress. Uh, so she is multi-talented. And um, she is going to tell you something about storytelling uh, with the First Peoples. And as I've put here, uh, storytelling is extremely important. Um, but this is something that just happens when people gather together. It's a way of passing on history. It's a way of showing people how they should live. It's a way of learning about one's culture. It's, uh, it can include songs. It can include action. So it is multidisciplinary. Yanni, please. I'm often too short for these things, so. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, um, Miigwech, thank you very much um, uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, uh, my name, my English name is uh, Yanni or Jani Lozon, and uh, my uh, Odawa et Ojibwe name means North Wind Woman, um, and I am part of Bear Clan, I am Bear Clan. Um, uh, so I'm going to do two things today because that's just how my brain works. Um, I want to talk a little bit and then I want to, I'm going to share a story as we go along because I think there's some important things to um, preface the story with and also to interject the story with. And these come out of uh, many years of my working in theater as an actor and also uh, in my communities and with my elders and I've put all of these ideas together and hopefully they make some sense to somebody other than myself but um, one of the things that I realized early on in terms of my um, my acting work and my training in acting was that I was unlike most of the other actors that I was working with and nor did uh, was I accepted into um, a standard format of uh, education for acting schools. I just didn't quite fit into the mold that they were looking for. I was, I came a little bit later to the craft. I, um, I, I for my national theater audition, I did a, a, a jingle dress dance, which at the time wasn't considered uh, professional dance. Uh, so there were many things that I found myself bumping up against. And so as an actor and, and in training as an actor, I started to look at uh, working in theater in a different way. I had the pleasure of working with some pretty incredible people. Um, one of them was an elder that I did a fair, I spent a fair amount of time with. His name was Sam Ozalmik. Uh, he's from Kaboni, he was from Kaboni on uh, Manitoulin Island, and I spent, I spent a lot of time with Sam. And Sam was that kind of person who taught through storytelling. So we would be sitting outside having a cup of tea, or I'd be trying to make him bannock. <laughs> I was trying to make bannock so that it didn't taste like a hockey puck. But um, Sam, we would be sitting there and he'd be silent, and then uh, suddenly he'd say, Well, you know. You don't stop thinking so much; it's gonna, you know, it's gonna kill you. And and then it made me realize that, um, or he would tell a story about one day he we were just sitting there and he would just sit in silence. And oftentimes he would sit in silence until we uh, came, until he came to something that he felt that I needed to uh, to understand or to learn. And he said, um, he said, yep. 
I remember the first day where I was able to see through those walls. And so he would do things like this in such a way where he would set up his story that would follow in such a way that um, uh, it made me really think differently. Um, the other uh, incredible two teachers that I had was a man named Richard Pachinko who um, taught clowning. He had uh, combined a methodology of European clowning and uh, and had researched a number of clown societies in First Nations communities and he had put a lot of those ideas together and come up with a methodology or a way of training creative people, not actors, but to release the creativity inside yourself. And then I also had the opportunity of studying with a man named Yoshi Ueda, who was a Japanese monk who um, is a world-renowned uh, theatre practitioner. And I put all of those things that those people put together and I came up with uh, some things that, that made sense to me, that I felt that we had lost in some, in some aspects, we had lost in our communities. And that was based on this idea that we've transformed from an oral culture into a written culture. And what is that? What does that mean for us as people? What does that mean for us as communities? What does that mean for us as artists? And what does that mean for us in terms of democratic society and how our democracy works within our communities? Transforming from oral culture to a written culture, I feel that we'd lost a lot of things. One of the things that we had lost was our ability to um, learn uh, not just something that we'd memorized off a page. And so this goes back to what Yoshi Oida used to talk about, where um, knowledge isn't knowledge until you've re repeated it 10,000 times. So once you've repeated something 10,000 times, then you really know it. So the difference between oral culture and written culture is that when you're we're immersed in an oral culture, you, you must repeat and repeat and repeat so that the knowledge goes into the body in a different way than it does when you just memorize something with your mind off the page. That's what we used to do. We used to memorize our stories or learn our stories by repetition and by living them. Instead of just memorizing or writing down, we lived our stories and it was part of our everyday existence. So I came up with a catchphrase that I often use in not only my teaching, uh, but also in my everyday life, and that is, our bodies are our books. So everything that we need to know, and even everything that we need to remember, and everything that we need to go and search for, we can find inside our body. And that was the methodology that not only Yoshi Oida, but uh, Richard Pachinko and also Sam Ozamak was trying to teach me. If I needed to find something out for myself, I had the place to go. It was inside myself and it was inside my body because my body holds all of that generational memory and it holds all of those stories that are within me. So I want to share just a personal story and then we'll get on to a cultural story. I was developing a theater piece with of some friends of mine and we were using some improvisational theatrical uh, methodologies in order to write some text. And uh, I was working with a man named Floyd Favel, who is a, is a, uh, a very, um, he's a genius. He's a Cree a director, playwright, and uh, had also borrowed a lot from another man named uh, uh, Grotowski. And we were doing some improvisations and um, out popped this character for me, and, uh, and this little character was a mouse, and the mouse, uh, as, uh, the mouse lived inside of the center of the earth, and she was the keeper of the books, and she was very upset because the books hadn't been used for quite a while, and it wasn't evident that anybody was coming to use the books anytime soon. And so I was developing this character, we were writing these plays, and uh, I was sharing this information with a friend of mine who's uh, Haida from the West Coast and she said, oh yeah, mouse woman, we have all sorts of mouse woman stories, that's part of, that's part of our, um, that's our teachings, those are our teachings, they come through mouse woman. And I went, oh really? And, um, and uh, so I, I, I thought, wow, isn't that interesting that that information was there inside me 
uh, and something I had not known on an intellectual level. But I, store, I had stored that in, inside my body, and it took a theatrical methodology at the time in the 21st century for me to actually retrieve that information, but it's there for, for all of us if we choose to go inside of ourselves and to remind ourselves who in fact we are. I think the other thing that happened to all of us is that um, in the First Nations and Métis communities is that, um, as is well-known history, um, it became unsafe for us to be who we were. And that included our cultural expression. And so at some point in time, we were separated from ourselves. On top of that, I see that in the dominant society as well. There is a separation between the artist in ourselves and how we work within the democratic society. And um, so the idea of being an artist has been separated from self. There's we, we go to see a play at seven o'clock and we uh, go to choir practice at such and such a time, but we've lost that integration where being a creative person is part of our everyday existence. As, as we were talking earlier about the integration of song and movement in our everyday existence. We used to get up every morning and sing. It's the first thing we did. We sang, we sang to the sun that rose. We said thank you to the sun. We, uh, we sang uh, when the hunt came back to, uh, to celebrate the, the, uh, the, uh, the food that had, that had been brought into the community. We sang for uh, new names for children. We sang for death. We sang and we danced for um, something that happened every single day. It's time and it has been part of our uh, the things that the grandmothers and the grandfathers have kept within them is to keep that culture going no matter what. There are stories of grandmothers who, they call them the whispering songs. When At the time when our songs and our stories were outlawed, the grandmothers were, would whisper those songs and stories into the ears of the babies so that it could still be passed on. It was done in such a way and in such a secret way that it was still being passed on, but it was done in a safe way so that it was still possible to, to so those grandmothers kept and grandfathers kept that culture going in a time when it was not safe for us to do so. It's our generation and the generations that follow that are bringing those songs and stories back into our everyday life and coming back to who we are as people. So here's a story that Sam shared with, with me one time, and I think it speaks to that circle that we've, that we've come back to. So, not exactly sure when this took place, but there is a story about a small group of Anishinaabe people who were unsatisfied with the land that they lived on. Um, they didn't think that it was as beautiful as what they saw over a little further over to the west, a little further over across that little river way over there. It looked like a much better place to be. It looked like the berries were fatter and it looked like there were more fish. And maybe it, it meant that there were more animals over there uh, for their annual hunts. And, but they weren't sure how to get to that place, and so they convinced one of the young guys in the community, they said, you take care of it, you ask, you do that for us. And he said, well, I'm not really sure how to do that, so, but I will, I'll take that on for us, because I want to go there too, I want something better than what I have. So he went to the riverside, and he put some tobacco down into that water, and up came a small trout, and the trout said, I've come to answer your prayer. You've offered tobacco. What is it that you're looking for? And the young man said, we want to go over there because it looks like a much better place than what we have here. We have, um, we have berries and we have fish, but it looks like it's much better over there. And the trout said, all right, I will bring you there. So he brought that small group of Anishinaabe people over to that new place. But when they got there, what they realized was that they weren't sure which berries that they could actually eat because they weren't familiar with the berries in that territory and the, the fish looked different and, and in fact it didn't look much better at all than what they had left but then they saw that further over into the west it looked like it was much more beautiful than where they even were at that point. 
And so again, they turned to this young man and he said, okay, I will pray again. So he put that tobacco down again and this time the fox came. And the fox said, I've answered your prayer, you've put that tobacco down. And the young group and the, and the young man said, uh, we're, we want to move to a place that is better because this place that we have here isn't as good as that place looks to be over there. Uh, and it it's, looks so beautiful over there and it looks like the berries are fuller and it looks like there's more animals over there. And so the fox said, all right, I will answer your prayers. You've put that tobacco down and I will lead you to that place. And so he led them to that place. But in that place, there were no trees at all, and there was hardly any berries. In fact, there was lots of flowing grass, and you could see for miles and miles and miles, and it was a very beautiful place, but they couldn't find ways to feed themselves, and they didn't know which berries they should eat, and they weren't familiar with the animals there. So again, they went to that young man and said, look at over there, it's really beautiful over there where it looks like those mountains rise up into the sky. If we could get to this top, the top of those mountains, that would be the place that we should go. And so that young man put more tobacco down. And this time the buffalo came. And the buffalo said, are you sure you want to go there? And they all said, yes. We see that place over there as being a better place than we are now. And so the buffalo said, I will answer that prayer, you've put that tobacco down. So he brought all of those Anishinaabe people over to where, where the mountains rise into the sky. But then they discovered that they didn't know how and didn't know which berries to pick. They weren't familiar with the animals in, in the mountains. It was cold, it was a different kind of climate. And so they decided this time they, they would go, that they turned their direction north and again they put tobacco down and again, but this time the bear, the polar bear came and said, I will lead you up to my land. You will love it there, it's beautiful. But when they got there, they still weren't satisfied with, one of the, with where they, they were at and they didn't know how to take care of themselves there. And at that time, they started to dream about this amazing and beautiful place that they remembered inside their minds and inside their bodies. And they talked about this beautiful place that they envisioned, this place where the berries were plentiful, where the deer was plentiful, where there were rolling hills and, and rivers that could take them far and, and be, uh, be highways that would take them from one place to another. And when they were going through this memory uh, and and envisioning these things that had come up from their bodies and had uh, reminded them of the things that they were looking for, what they realized was that the very place that they had started from was that very place that they had envisioned. And so they came back to the very place that they started from and they put that tobacco down again and they thanked all of those animals that had led them on that circle journey so that they could return to the place from where they started, which was back to community, back to the land that they knew, back to the way of living that they had understood, and back to the songs and the dances that they had grown up with in their own particular culture. And that's what we're doing now in our communities. We're returning to those dances, we're returning to those teachings, and we're returning to the stories, some of them that have been forgotten and some of, the, some of them that have not because they've been whispered forward by the grandmothers and the grandfathers. And some of them that have been lost, we are still finding because what we understand now is that we have kept them inside our bodies all of this time. So even though they may be uh, may be transformed slightly when we go into our bodies that are our books to retrieve those stories. We may bring them out in a slightly different way. We may use multimedia now to tell those stories that we would have said orally. We may use paintings, we may use quilts, we may use PowerPoint presentations, but those stories are inside of ourselves and we're going in now and we're retrieving them and we're bringing them back out because this is the time of the seventh going into the eighth generation fire where we will come back. Um, and the importance of our knowledge in terms of uh, moving forward as a country will be very important. So my last words that I want to share with you are 
going back to Sam Mozarnik and the time I spent with him, I asked him one day, I said, so this country that we live in now, it's not doing so well. What should we be thinking of? And he said, well, you know, because he started everything with, well, you know. <laughs> he said, well, you know, Canada's like a tree. You gotta feed the roots. And if the roots are healthy, then the tree will be healthy. And so, in order for this country to be healthy, we need to feed the roots of this country. Each branch of that tree can be a different aspect of multiculturalism, but the roots of this country are in and from and embedded in Aboriginal perspective.